got your Bible, please don't answer. Let me see anybody. But it is a new one. Okay. You bring your Bible in every week. <coughs> steps that please the Lord. And remember, all these steps are things that help keep us in our right relationship with Him. We want to stay in the right relationship with Him because that's where the strength and the power, the ability of the Holy Spirit to overcome whatever it is this destructive, habitual addiction in our life. And it's not just drugs, it's other things too. Yeah. Uh, anger, bitterness, rage, violence, jealousy, covetousness, all sorts of things Satan will use to get a stronghold in their life. So when an RU student comes in here tonight, this is the first time they've been here, first two or three times, I say, what in the world is what he's got to do tonight teaching us got to do with me getting off the drugs or off alcohol? It all ties in together. It feeds that man, it builds that, on that foundation, it feeds that spiritual wall so that we can stay in the right relationship with God so that we do have the overcoming power in our life to overcome whatever there is that could be a stronghold and destructive thing. <clears throat> so tonight we're going to talk about being men and women who are giving. And I want you to uh, get your Bible ready because we're going to look at a couple passages of Scripture other than what's in the lesson. And uh, if you want to go ahead and kind of get your fingers stuck in the book of Proverbs and stick something there so you can be ready to turn. And the book of Malachi. Malachi is that very last book in the Old Testament before you go over into the New Testament. The first book in the New Testament is Matthew. And so if you go to Matthew, which is the first book in the New Testament, which is, and I know this sounds simplistic, but I understand that a lot of people are still trying to learn how to use Bibles. If you're looking for Matthew, in most Bibles that are red letter editions, the first red writing that you come to in the Bible is the book of Matthew. So if you go to the book of Matthew, Right back to the left, or back north, or back in that direction, you'll go to the book of Malachi, it's the last book in the Old Testament. We're going to be looking there, and then we're going to look at a, another couple of passages of Scripture, but I'll help you find them when it comes time. So let's talk about being men and women who are giving. Now, let me tell you before we go any further in this lesson, because it's going to get you to a place in where you're going to say, Oh, he's just a pastor, and I want him pastor preaching about money. Giving money. All he talks about giving up. Mm -mm. I'm not the pastor of this church. I'm not the pastor of any church. All I am is a Bible teacher trying to give you spiritual truth. So when we get to that place, I want to remind you that again. So I'm not preaching about money. But it's part of our teaching tonight. And we'll get to it in a minute. We ought to always, I'm at eight on page number 89, men and women who are giving. We ought to always be willing to give of what God gives us. To give of what God gives us. And notice the scripture there. First Chronicles. And it's going to list some things. And listen to these things. And I will highlight them when we get finished. Both riches and honor come of thee. And thou reignest over all. And in thy hand is power and might. And in thy hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore our God we thank thee. And praise thy glorious name. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. Now the writer of the book of Chronicles is saying there toward the end, well, God, who are we that we should be able to give anything? Anybody? Notice some things that he, he kind of delineates there in that passage. Kind of, uh, the first thing you see, he says, riches. He says both riches, and then he says honor. He mentions authority or power, and we, we kind of see those two things together. He mentions that towards physical strength, might, or physical strength. He talks about greatness, or we would think about uh, uh, being held in esteem. And then he talks about toward the end there, he talks about uh, just the abilities that you give us, or strengths or abilities. And so we got to recognize that God's going to give us things. Number one, he gave us his son and died on the cross to pay the penalty for the sin that we could not pay for. He gave us that because of his mercy and his love for us. And in the moment that we accepted that, the moment we said, yes, I believe in the death, burial, and resurrection, I 
believe that Jesus went down in that grave. He arose again to live forevermore. The moment we said, I believe that, and we believe in our heart, then he gives us the Holy Spirit. He gave Jesus to die on the cross, paid the penalty of our sin. He gives us the Holy Spirit to walk with us and guide us every day. And by the way, unless you're fooling yourself, you are fooling yourself to think that it's you that has overcome anything in your life. Right. Mm-hmm. How many of you tried to quit doing something on your own strength before you ever mm-hmm. now, had I mean, even if something as simple as to quit eating or quit smoking or quit drinking soft drinks or sodas or to quit doing meth or to quit doing heroin or to quit drinking or to quit uh, being envious or to quit coveting money, all of those things, if we ever try to do any of those in our own strength, you know what happens? I mean, I see what we fail. We have. We fail. So we need not think that anything that we have or any ability that we have to overcome anything our life. God gives it to us. And so that's why we want to stay in that right relationship with Him. So notice what it says there toward the first he says, both riches and honor come of thee, speaking of God, and thou reignest or is in charge over all. That means he's in possession and control. Now, the possession part, we can't do anything about it. You know why? Because Jesus' blood was shed and we accepted that, it was done deal. We are his. The moment we believe, we are his. We are in his possession. But now that other part, whether or not he has control in our life, we do something about that. We resist if we don't want to let God control and we accept and we submit and we do. So we have the power there to resist or submit to God's leading in our life. That's the Holy Spirit's work in our life. So he, we are his possession, and if we'll submit to him and yield to him, he'll be in control of our life. And by the way, I want him in control. I want him in control. Uh, I remember back when I was in basic training, uh, some of you remember this been in the service before, there's a period of time there when you're in basic training. Sometimes it's even after you get on up to AIT. That you're caught, that you're, it meant it said that you are in total control. You don't go anywhere that a drill sergeant don't go. You don't go to the bathroom. You don't go to the mess hall. You don't go to the commissary. You don't go to the parade field. You don't go anywhere that that drill sergeant don't know. He's in total control of everything you do. Now, we are God's possession. We're his children. And, and he wants to be in total control. But he will not make so. If he did, he'd be spitting out Christians like little robots, cookie cutter Christians. We'd all just be marching around doing exactly what God wanted us to do all the time. But he don't do that. He gives us a free will. We have the free will first to exercise to accept Christ as our Savior. Now we every day have to make a choice. Am I going to submit to his control in my life or am I going to push back against it? Trust me. Most of you know, when you push back, you have trouble. When you submit, you're your God's Savior. And that's what we want to do. So he's in control. Notice what he said there at the end of that. Yeah, you might want to get me a bottle of water. Toward the end of that verse, he says, For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given thee. Everything that God gives us, he intends us to use for the benefit of others. We're not to hoard it up and keep it. You know, when we have a joyful day, you know what we're supposed to do? Share it with somebody. Well, this has been a rough day here the last few weeks. I've had some discouraged days, some frustrated days. I had some days when I just didn't feel like being joyful. But God says that when I have joy in my life, I'm to share it with others. Whatever he gives me, thank you. Whatever he gives me, I need to share with others. If I have an ability, which I don't have much of, if I have an ability to sing or play a musical instrument, guess what I'm supposed to do? Share that with others. If I have a little bit of knowledge of his word that he's opened me, my blinded eyes to, guess what I'm supposed to do? Share that with others. What has he given us that we should hold as our prized possession and share with others? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Give it to others. Everything that God's given.
gives us to expect us to use it. So we're going to say, well, <coughs> now let's talk for a moment about <coughs> God's biblical method for receiving. So if we're going to talk about giving to others and giving to other women, we got to get it first, right? I can't give something God had not give to. If I try to get up in that pulpit there, I try to get up behind this podium on a Friday night and open up my vast treasury of knowledge that I have here and share it with you, all I want, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to fall right off the end of that board because it's not of me, it's of him. And so if I expect to give it to you, I got to get it from him. And that's the same way we are. If we're going to if we're going to expect to give joy to others, we got to get joy from Him. So, getting the first part of that is the receiving. Notice what He says in Luke chapter number six: "Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, that means a lot of it, pressed down and shaken together, that means packed in there, and running over." shall men give unto your bosom, for with the same measure you meet without, it shall be measured to you again. Same measuring stick. You're just going to be greedy and stingy and give a little bit, guess what? You're just going to get a little bit. You ever heard somebody talk about this? Oh, well, I, I came to church today and I, I just, I just didn't, get, didn't get much out of it. Well, did you come with a wheelbarrow, a bucket, or a thimble? If you come with a thimble, you're going to get a thimble. Says they bring the wheelbarrow. You want to get a lot? You want to give a lot? Get a lot? Got to get a lot. <clears throat> Press down, shake it together, and run it over. Now notice in these verses, both of these verses we just looked at, he really he didn't really mention money, did he? Now he did mention riches or wealth, but look at the other things. There's five or six other things there other than money that he talked about. This verse does not mention money. It is a promise for any given commodity, including money. Anything that God gives us, we're to have the same thought with it. We are to, uh, to take it in and give it out. And the more that we can take in, the more that we can give out. Now, our giving precedes our getting. Now, here's what happens. We get up in the morning and say, God, if you just fill my life and my heart with joy and peace and tenderness and kindness and compassion and comfort, and I'll give it out to everybody I see. Does he do it that way? No. No. we got to start giving. And as we give it, he'll start filling it in. Uh, we, don't, we, we, we don't act like the Dead Sea. You know why they call the Dead Sea the Dead Sea? Because water flows into it, but there's no outlet. It's just not like the lake at, at our house. we got a lake that's spring-fed. And the water flows in from underground springs. But all the way down on the other end down there, where the dam is, there's a spillway, a pipe. And when it gets up to that level, it runs out and goes out. It comes in, builds up a big pile, and then it runs out. Just like in our life. What we, that spring of living water, what did Jesus say? We'll proceed from him a spring of living water. We'll take it in and take it in and take it in and you know what'll happen? All of a sudden we'll start flowing out. Flowing out. Flowing out. The Bible says from the abundance of the heart and mind speak. Yeah. Now in the meantime we're looked at in the negative context. Oh, we got bitterness and anger and hate and resentment in our hearts and it's gonna bubble over and come on, and it will. But if you'll replace all that, remember there's a couple times in the Bible and I won't we'll talk about scripture as we can find them later. A couple of times in the Bible when the nation of Israel picked an Old Testament came across places where the water wasn't fit to drink. A couple of different times, springs of water that was bubbling up that just, just wasn't fit to drink. And God always said to his man, whether it was Elijah or whether it was Moses or whoever it was, he said, do this or this or this. And when you do this, it'll make that water good to drink. It'll make it sweet. That's the same way with us, bubbling up inside. We want that spring of living water. We want that sweet water to bubble up and bubble out. So our, our giving precedes our getting. The more we give, the quicker we give, the more likely we are to get. Our 
creating is more abundant than our giving. It's running over. That's what the left could say. It said it was pressed down and running over. Our getting is more abundant than our giving. You've heard that expression. I think it's mentioned in the lesson. Yeah. You, know, you can't outgive God. You know, sometimes when you're when you're when you're uh, trying to act uh, all logical, you say, "Hmm." And then, you know, I will give away all my joy today because you know I want to have enough joy to get me through the day. That's that. That's not God's principle. God says, you just take in the joy and you give out. And the more that you give out, the more that I'll fill it in and replace it. The more you give away, the more I'll give you. We can't have give. And then he said, men will be returning your investment. Men. So when you give out honor or you give out sight or you give out whatever it is, the ability, when you give that for the benefit of others, when you use it in other people's lives, God will give it back to you, and most of the time it comes from somebody else. You know, we, we kind of look around and expect to say, all right, God, you know, I need a blessing today, and we kind of walk around the house in the morning before we leave, looking up at the ceiling, God's going to give me a blessing today, come blessing down on me today, when really and truly that blessing, whatever it may be, comes when you start interacting with other people. How many times have you ever heard somebody say, Right. Well, just take money, for instance, to give somebody a little money to help them along the way. They say, boy, you just don't know. This was just right. This was exactly when I needed it. This would meet the need I had. Boy, you have been such a blessing to me. But really and truly, you know, it might not be the $10 or $5 or $100. You're the one that got blessed. Why? Because you're obedient. You gave. And many times you gave out of your in other words, you didn't really think you had it. Thought I was with it. How many times you ever give something God replace it tenfold? Now again, I'm not talking about just money. That is peace or comfort, wisdom or guidance, consolation. Or you just thought, I just don't have much. You can give what little word of encouragement you had. And before you know it, God restored that encouragement in your life tenfold. The measuring stick that limits our giving will also limit our receiving. We have already said that. Measuring stick. That's what he said over in that scripture where he said, with all. For with the same measure that ye meet or give out, with all it shall be measured to you again. If you want a lot, give a lot. If you want a little, give a little. Now let's talk about money. Oh, here we go. This is, this is a spiritual truth that all Christians need to understand. Whether it's coming from a pastor standing behind the pulpit or whether it's coming from a Bible teacher. Notice what the lesson says, Luke chapter 6. We're number one there. Getting and giving riches. Riches. Luke chapter 6. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much. And he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, and that word mammon, you can just substitute money right there. That's a perfect substitution. Who will commit to your trust the true riches? If you've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, heard all these things, and they derided him. Because the Pharisees were covered. They were money hungry. They were greedy. How many of you ever seen movies? You see these movies on TV where it shows, like, Jesus in Jerusalem and uh, all these different movies. When you see the Pharisees and the Sadducees, what, what kind of clothes are they wearing? Yeah. They got the Gucci and the DKNS and the I mean, they got, you know, they got the good stuff on. And what does Jesus and the rest of his followers have on? Right. And they got them old robes they dug up out. They slept on them at night and they wore them today, you know. So you see, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they, they were, they had sticky fingers. They wanted that money. And Jesus said they were covetous. And they were, uh, they were angry about this. Why? Because they were talking about money. Listen, money is a tool and a resource to be used just like the ability to play piano, just like
like the ability to give a word of encouragement, uh, just like the ability to teach a lesson from God's word, just like the ability to sing in the choir, whatever it is, anything that God gives us, they are tools for us to use for other people's benefit so that we can glorify God who gave them to us. Money is the same way. But we live in a world where money has become the idol, right? We know that. I mean, I get aggravated when folks start talking on TV and you know, football season comes out. Y'all you know, you know I'm not a football, a big football fan. And I watch it, but my wife watches it. And I'm not going to do a commercial for you know. But the other day I was watching on TV when they were getting ready for the pregame, you know, football season just kicked off. You tell me how in the world a man, a man, just a simple man like me, or you, thinks that he can be worth $27 million a year to coach a football team. What's wrong with that picture? Cars and buildings. $27 million a year to be a coach of a football team. And there's people in the United States starving to death. I don't get it. I don't understand it. The priorities, who ever said that, the priorities are in the wrong place. Money's becoming an idol. It's not just the resource for God's people. Do. Does that happen in the church? One of the Christian publications I read, it kind of keeps up with the news, I was just reading about this pastor that two or three weeks ago, a couple months ago now, supposedly got robbed and mugged in the pulpit. Uh, these guys came in with guns and put everybody on the floor and took all this jewelry. He had $400,000 he had one watch on one arm worth $75,000, and he had another watch on the other arm worth $45,000. And all of this robbed him of $400,000 worth of jewelry on his body while he was standing in the pulpit preaching. Well, they come to find out it was a hoax. So the reason why I tell you that is it's not just the world out there. It's the world in here, too. Money has become a big deal. And Satan uses that. Now, let's kind of tighten the net up a little bit. I told you I was going to get to the part where we're going to cut a little bit. The moment you accepted Christ as your Savior, your money became his money. You ever heard that? You used to make a joke all the time. He got saved, but his checkbook did. No, when we get saved, our checkbook gets saved too. But let's talk about it. Open your Bible to the book of Malachi. Remember now, Malachi is that last book right before you get to Matthew. Spiritual truth we all need to understand as Christians now. Some of you go to church here where I go to church. Some of you go to other churches. And again, I'm not a pastor preaching from a pulpit about getting money coming in. But this principle that is taught about stewardship is a spiritual principle that needs to be understood by all Christians no matter where you are. Over in the book of Malachi, chapter number 3, look at verse 8. But will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? Notice what he said, the answer to that question. In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Now, he's talking about people, and he's talking about tithes and offerings. Now, just kind of basic, simple Bible 101. Tithe means 10%. That's where we get that word. That's why that tithe in the church, wherever you go to church at, they talk about your tithe being 10%. That's where it comes from. That word tithe means exactly that. And so it's been instituted from the very beginning to give that part of that money, your resource, back into God for the operation of the facilities and the promotion of the gospel. Now, let me just throw out a little preacher point right here. Nowhere in the Bible do you find it that God has ordained churches to operate off of fundraisers and special givings. It's not so. God intended for the tithe all along to be what supports the operation of the facility that gets God's message out. If a congregation has 10 people, they're in a facility that they can support with the tithe that comes in. Get, get their congregation bigger, the bigger they get, the more money, the bigger their tithe, and so on. So let's kind of get that. This is a basic stewardship thought. But notice what he says after that. Verse number 
He said he times on verse number nine. Ye are cursed from the curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Look at what he says, verse number ten. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven, and pour you out a blessing, and ye shall not be enough, be room enough to receive it. Now, he's talking about bringing tithes into the storehouse. We know that as a stewardship principle. That's the back of the pew that you're sitting in. You've got a little envelope sitting there. Okay, you come in, put that in there, and it goes into the offering to support the work of the church. But let's notice, as you go a little bit further, how important this is. It's important for us. Verse number 11. And I will rebuke the devourer, devourer, for your sake. Who is the devourer? Our enemy, Satan. And he said, I'll rebuke him if you're doing this right thing. And he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground, neither shall your vine cast your bright fruit for the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for ye shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. What is he promising us when we are good stewards with not just the money? But all the resources that he gives us, our time, and boy, that's a big, that, that in fact is almost on that same idolatrous pedal, pedestal as money is, right? Time. My time. Well, what time do you give the Lord now? We could break that down, and I've done it before. How many hours in a day, or how many minutes in an hour, and all that? How many minutes of that day do you give to the Lord? That means time studying his word, talking to him in prayer, meditation. See how this works? It's not just dollars and cents. It's all of the resource that God provides us with. Giving back and getting from Him so that we can minister to others with it. And what does He promise us when we do? And by the way, we're going to end the lesson right here. We won't go any further. We won't go into getting and giving honor tonight. What He promises us when we are faithful stewards. Notice, look in your lesson at Luke passage there. One, two, Four times at least, I say maybe more. Four times he uses the word faithful. Faithful. If we are faithful to take the resources that God gives us, look at these principles we just talked about is getting and giving. If we're faithful to do that and not rob God and not hold back and not seek our own, he has promised that he will defend us from Satan. He protects us. And he'll protect our crops. Of course, none of us in here are farmers, but you get the, he'll protect your money-making operation, whatever it is you do to be productive. He'll, increase. he'll protect that, and he'll even increase it. So you see, this idea about giving, it's not just a money thing. It's everything that God gives us. It's the attitude of our heart. It's our mindset. It's our physical strength. It's the money, the tool that we use, all of those things. And God says it's a very simple concept. The more you give for the benefit of others, the more I'll pour into you. And what does he say there in the book of Malachi? He says, when you don't do that, guess what? You're robbing us. That's, that's powerful right there. That's powerful. But that's the spiritual principle we all need to learn to live by. Getting and giving according to God's word. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for a few minutes tonight to talk about this thought, these principles here about getting and giving. And Lord, I help you, pray that you help us understand that all of this fits into that plan of us walking according to your word and, and being in the same direction with the same mindset that you have us to have so that we can have the protection from Satan, so that we can have the, the overpowering, the overcoming presence of power of Holy Spirit in operation in our you teach us here in your word that when we hold back, when we don't submit, when we don't yield, that we're robbing or taking from you. And Lord, we don't want to do that. We want to be good. We want to be good givers. We want to be good users of the resources to benefit others. So you will be our protection, our strength, our power, and our might in a time of trouble. So Lord, we just ask you tonight to help us understand how this lesson fits into our lives. Becky Waters.